Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. We pray that you are well, and please know that you are in our prayers. In today's webinar, Scott Weeman will share how the church is called to respond to those dealing with addiction. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. My mouse is not acting right. Here we go. I would like to recognize our webinar partners, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to our presenter using the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel. I will read as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording will be sent to you tomorrow via email. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Scott Weeman is the founder and executive director of Catholic in Recovery, a nonprofit organization that seeks to help those suffering with addictions. He also serves an, as an associate marriage and family therapist. Weeman is the author of The 12 Steps and the Sacraments. He has appeared on EWTN's The Journey Home, as well as Women of Grace, Christopher Closeup, Catholic Answers, and the Ave Explores podcast. His work has been featured on Aletea and Pathios. He earned his bachelor's degree in organizational management in 2017 from Point Loma Nazarene University, where he has also earned his master's degree in clinical counseling. Weeman and his wife Jacqueline serve as young adult coordinators at St. Bridget Parish in San Diego, California. Scott, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure being here. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter here and come. I'll come back on when we are done, when you are done. All right. So greetings, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, today, as a result of some recent um, stay-at-home mandates in the state of California, where I live, um, I'm coming to you to from from my home. So, uh, yeah, all all may happen. You know, I may have my daughter walking in, although um, likely not. But I'm I'm grateful that you're here, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to advance the discussion about addiction recovery in the church and what the church can do to respond to support healing for individuals, families, and communities. And so um, we'll dive into all this. Uh, here's a little bit of an overview as far as what we'll get into. We'll open in prayer. I'll provide a little introduction about myself, discuss the nature of the problem, some various types of addictions, compulsions, and unhealthy attachments, provide uh, an overlap, which is discussed in my book, The 12 Steps in the Sacraments, A Catholic Journey Through Recovery, uh, about the 12 steps and the sacramental life of the church. Um, we'll, we'll, we won't spend a ton of time on that, but I will have an opportunity to pass along these slides if anyone is interested. And we'll then look at the process of change. What does that look like? What um, recipes are necessary for um, inspiring and creating uh, long-lasting change in individuals and families and in communities? Discussing, of course, some of the uh, very powerful forces that we're working against and um, getting into things that way, and we'll conclude with prayer. Uh, so join me, please, in, in um, praying the full version of the serenity prayer. You may be familiar with the first part of it. Um, I think that this prayer in its entirety is very beautiful and has gotten me through um, some very personal challenging times. So we'll begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> that prayer, 
is a prayer that I should, that I um, recited probably hundreds of times a day in my first couple of days and weeks of, of sobriety and recovery. And I think that especially as we're um, navigating through new times, unique circumstances, challenges in life with um, uncertainty of um, COVID-19, that this prayer for me has been especially grounding and helpful. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is most things um, around me, certainly things that are very distant and far away, the courage to change the things I can, my attitude and my behavior mostly, and the valuable wisdom to know the difference. So I hope that um, as we're all you know, finding new tools and ways to cope with some uh, new circumstances, that this might be a tool that's helpful for you. A little bit about me, um, and Aaron, I appreciate the introduction, very, uh, very nice. I am first and foremost a beloved son of God, which I believe he is well pleased, and um, a husband and a father. I had the opportunity to, um, I've been married to my wife, Jacqueline, for about three and a half years. As mentioned, we are uh, joint coordinators of young adult ministry at St. Bridget Parish in San Diego, where we met, and where my life was um, really found new life uh, as a result of getting sober and finding life in the church. Um, I am. I started as, as a result of my own recovery from addiction and alcoholism, a variety of addictions, uh, which I'll, I'll dive into a bit. Um, I then founded Catholic in Recovery and I now serve as the executive director uh, where we provide addiction recovery resources for individuals, families and communities and um, really try to advance the conversation about addiction recovery in the church rooted in faith, fellowship and freedom. Um, I'm the author of The 12 Steps in the Sacraments, A Catholic Journey Through Recovery, which was a gift to write and, um, and hear how it's you know, shaped others' lives. And after graduating from a master's degree in clinical counseling from Point Loma Nazarene University in August of 2019, I now um, also serve as an associate marriage and family therapist. And I um, have a heart for working with families, couples, individuals, um, in particular those that are impacted by addiction. And here for the sake of um, sharing uh, some personal photos, this is a, uh, my 20 month old daughter, Dorothy, um, who we love. And we have another baby girl on the way uh, due in late June. I found that if I, when I share families of my uh, photos of my family, when I'm speaking or in other um, uh, forums like this, that it's, it helps disarm you and uh, create a closer connection and, and relatability, which is one important thing that I'll get to. This picture here, a photo that was taken um, about nine months into my own recovery journey. I believe it was in June or July of 2012. And this is a picture with a woman named Dorothy, who uh, our daughter is named after and who um, I had the opportunity to go on a long road trip with um, during that time. I was nine months sober. She was 43 years sober. Uh, we had met each other in the recovery fellowship, which saved my life. And then I would see her every weekend at daily mass at 9 a.m. mass. And we would uh, go next door to the Lutheran uh, church where they were serving coffee. We didn't have a coffee kind of stand yet. Um, and we would drink their coffee, which was prepared by a Catholic who was also a recovering alcoholic. And um, we would just spend a half hour to 45 minutes together every day. And she would, um, you know, reflect on, on some of the thoughts that she had and uh, really enjoyed living some of the vicarious adventures of my early sobriety. So uh, that picture is very meaningful to me and just goes on to just show the, you know, the, the people, individuals who had a really lasting impact from me. And um, those people can come in a variety of shapes and forms and, and fashions. A few quick points that I want to get to, and this first slide uh, clearly dispels that, is addiction does not discriminate. And so there's a few things that as we're serving and pastoring to the needs of those impacted by addiction, compulsive behavior, and unhealthy attachments, um, let's note that addiction does not discriminate based on socioeconomic status, um, based on you know ethnicity, race, um, gender, clergy or layperson. Addiction impacts all of us. And um, there is no one way to find um, protect immunity from addiction other, you know, other than maintaining a spiritual connection with God in some ways. And we'll get into some of that. I'm not really great. I'll, I'll be honest with the prevention side of things. If I was, I probably wouldn't um, be in this position myself. A blessing. But um, recovery is something that I know very well. Additionally, let's also note that addiction is not a moral referendum on one's life. Uh, the presence of an addiction in you know someone's life does not necessarily mean does not mean at all uh, that their character is under question or that there are um, moral questions in the person's life. Addiction is not a moral issue. Additionally, no human power can relieve us of addiction. Um, there is, although 
those that are actively you know, struggling with alcoholism and a variety of addictions will, um, will try to show this otherwise uh, and oftentimes to extreme ends. Um, but my experience and understanding tells us that no human power can relieve us of addictions. Therefore, we need to find a power that is greater than ourselves, which um, as Catholics, we have the means of being a little bit more specific than that. And finally, it is easier to put on slippers than to carpet the world. This uh, quote here, I believe, is profound in noting, and, and we can relate this to all sorts of um, scenarios in our lives, but especially important to note when serving and ministering to family members or others, and those that are struggle with addiction themselves, is that oftentimes we want to change circumstances around us. And in you know, my experience with addiction, which had a lot of self-centeredness to it, and I believe that self-centeredness and um, it is a, a, a strong theme that is uh, um, common among people with a variety of different types of addiction. And regularly, that means that we're, we kind of set ourselves as victims in scenarios, regularly forgetting about the damage that we've done to family members and loved ones along the way. Um, but, you know, very, very mindful of um, the world around us not seeming fair. And therefore, you know, or, or out of control or we're powerless over it. And that's certainly true. And we're certainly becoming well aware of that as a culture and individually um, in the midst of this global pandemic, that we're not in control. And um, the few things that we might be able to control would be our attitudes and our behavior. Therefore, it is easier to put on slippers than to carpet the world. So a few different types, I'll talk, I'll, I'll refer often addictions, compulsions, and unhealthy attachments. Um, I am not one to diagnose someone as an addict. That's something that they need to do themselves. And in the process of that self-discovery, I believe that important processes for change take place. Um, but we'll categorize addiction, compulsions, unhealthy attachments, uh, generally as a variety of things. Alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography and sex addiction, uh, relationship attachment, gambling addiction, overeating and other eating-related issues, um, technology addiction, codependency, the impact of a family, on addiction as well as something to be um, strongly considered. Noting that about roughly averages, 45 to 68% of, of all Americans are impacted by addiction, alcoholism and drug addiction in some way. Um, and this is either directly through their own use or by impacted by a loved one, um, which is a huge number. And you know, I, this, and it, what also makes it interesting is that when I'm sharing in, often in these settings, I'm speaking to you both as someone who serves the church through pastoral ministry, various pastoral ministries, but also likely as someone who has also been impacted by a loved one's addiction. So um, I will speak to you kind of from both of those places. Perhaps you yourself are uh, an addict in recovery or not in recovery as well. Um, so your experience may have some consistency with, with what I'm sharing. But various types of addiction, many of us, most of us, if not all of us, are impacted in some way. Again, 45 to 68 percent of Americans are impacted by drug addiction or alcoholism. And I think we should note the three stages of alcoholism very quickly. And um, those three stages being the first being fun, the second stage being fun with problems, and third stage being problems. Um, and I think that that categorizes in, in many ways this um, transition from social behavior, escaping, um, you know, challenges in our own lives, coping, using these as coping mechanisms into the process of it becoming an active addiction and beyond um, the, the healing of, a, of, an, of an individual human. We need God uh, in order to heal that um, addiction compulsive, com or compulsive behavior. Um, in addition, of course, we are also well aware of the problems faced by um, pornography and sex-related addictions. Um, I've most recently heard that 40% of women and 70% of men have viewed pornography in the last month. It's likely, too, that those numbers are, um, are conservative numbers, and this is a huge problem, something that is a challenge that we don't really often talk about in the church, but has significant impacts and really tears apart the fabric of, of families and um, individuals. And I've gotten the opportunity to, to walk with many men and women who are, um, have found fr freedom from the, um, a long lasting uh, battle with pornography and other sexual compulsions. 
Um, so something that as a church, we have the opportunity to really step up and other 12 steps groups, which may serve that particular need, um, may not do so with the same, I guess, sensitivities of the understanding of, um, of life as, as the Catholic church might. Um, and other, you know, other, one thing that I found as well is that uh, compulsive overeating and, and food related uh, addictions and compulsions are rampant in our culture, a very silent addiction that, that often goes undiscussed and is regularly untreated. Um, but there are uh, very active groups, um, fellowships that do serve um, those that struggle with compulsive overeating. And I found that that's a, another huge, really big uh, need within the church and demographic. Many people like myself will struggle with a variety or almost all of the above of these addictions. And so, you know, for, in my own personal journey, I have um, walked through alcoholism, drug addiction, lust-related addictions, gambling, um, compulsive overeating, anything that would often, you know, take me out of what the present moment is asking of me. And as we look at what are some common factors um, among these addictions, I would say there are three. And those tend to be denial, shame, and fear. Um, and this sense, these are three very, very strong, cunning, powerful, and baffling uh, factors that we need to pay respect to. And I think that too regularly we go about serving um, the needs of individuals, family members, or communities without necessarily taking this into consideration and um, or, or giving it the proper respect. And I believe that also these three factors are also, we find, kind of built into the institutional um, institutional nature of the church and so we need to be aware of that ourselves or you know am i are these actions or is my perception my um my view or understanding of a current situation is that rooted in some kind of denial shame or fear denial being a very very powerful thing one that um, we don't want to necessarily take a look at and we find this um the the powerful nature of denial in a variety of different settings um and I'm gonna share some, some as I refer to the process of change, I'm gonna to refer um, to a book called, it's, the title is Change or Die. It's by um, Alan Deutschman. And he refers to these uh, very, very elusive, very um, powerful factors, keeping us from really taking action um, oftentimes. And that denial is, as we can see in, in heart patients and others who have take life necessary, like life saving drugs, um, many people prefer not to take those drugs because they are a regular daily reminder of their um, of their condition and other things that you know as myself as a as a previous to recovery my alcoholism i was i was somewhat aware i very aware of uh, the problems caused by my addiction and compulsive behavior now i wasn't necessarily willing to take ownership of that nor was it prompting any kind of action because you know, having self-awareness does not necessarily lead to change. We need an experience with uh, that can reframe ourselves, reframe our vision of what our lives are like in our future, who we are in relationship to God and to other people, and um, in order to get through those very deep-seated um, factors of denial, shame, and fear. When I got sober, I had a drawer of unopened mail, and I knew what, when I received this mail, I largely knew what it, what it was. It was mostly collections or other people that were looking for, for money. Um, but just because I didn't want to see it, I didn't want to take a look at it. it didn't, I didn't want to be reminded of the pain and devastation caused by my, what I wouldn't have been able to define as my selfish actions. Um, that led me to largely isolate, keep secrets. Um, I was, of course, very ashamed of um, where I had been, you know, with much hope throughout high school and college and then falling into um, addiction um, left me ashamed. And, you know, much of the prompts by my loving family members and friends to get help, you know, you've got all these reasons, Scott, to change your, you know, change your lifestyle, change your behavior. Just think of the, you know, the lost schooling opportunity, the lost jobs, the lost relationships. Those were all things that I was well aware of, of course, trying to keep from my, um, my immediate knowledge. Um, and the, uh, Sharing of that, although coming from a really good place, wasn't really all that effective. It really just kind of kept me further into fear and isolation. I was very isolated when I got sober, when I first kind of took that action to um, find change through God. And um, so I need to learn a whole new set of ways to live life. And this speaks to that. Facts and fear are not effective ways to support healing. So, and, you know, it's funny. I started by <clears throat> noting a bunch of facts about um, you know, the nature of the problem. And um, 
that's that's not really all that effective unless it already fits within your frame of reference and in which case i probably don't necessarily need to um, convince you that some action needs to be taken but again whether we're talking to an individual who you know might um of course have thousands of reasons to change their lives or change their behavior um too too often we try to approach with facts and fear here are the facts and this is what's going to happen to you if you don't change <clears throat> I know this comes from a loving place and it's really oftentimes the best we've got. Um, but if we want to be effective, we need to try to set aside our impulse to present facts and fear as a way to um, change behavior. More on that as we get into the process of change. <clears throat> of course, you know, addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, a variety of types of addiction that I mentioned above um, has a huge impact on our culture hundreds of billions of dollars spent every year um, simply just on, on health care. Um, also, individuals <clears throat> living their lives in the sense of isolation, loneliness, shame, fear, and secrecy um, puts on, you know, it, it may be tough to state in some kind of like fact, of course, um, but lives damaged and many living in darkness. And it doesn't just stop with the addict. Um, in most cases, at least four to six other people are directly impacted by um, an addict's behavior. And those are largely fam family members. And unfortunately, the people who are most impact, impacted directly are children. And um, so much of that home, you know, a home with an addict, an addict, an alcoholic, um, will oftentimes be um, painted by sadness and hopelessness. And most importantly, this unpredictable nature of life. Um, <clears throat> we are probably now becoming a little bit more appreciative of um, of predictability in our lives as our lives now are becoming much um, kind of day by day that's the regular life and experience of an addict or of a family member of an addict who may not know if you know what the attitude of their uh, addictive family member is going to be and not only that but roles tend to shift dramatically within a family where addiction is present and that happens when one person is no longer able or capable of um, contributing to their responsibilities as a family member you'll see other people kind of shifting their their roles and responsibilities both to keep the image of the family intact and also just to keep you know the um keep the madness or the insanity from really really manifesting although you know unfortunately when we cater to the needs <clears throat> of the addiction then the whole family is is um the needs of the family are in some ways set aside as well. Often this leads to people assuming personal responsibility for the addiction, either, you know, a spouse, a, a child, a parent, um, wondering, you know, what did they do wrong or how could they be wrong in this? And that can lead to, you know, certainly a lot of isolation, depression and anxiety. Um, and in addition, you'll also see in many cases, some people taking roles of a caretaker, and this person who, if it's a, a parent who is the addicted person, the caretaker will oftentimes get more of the resentment from family members than even the addict themselves because they're seen as the one who is supporting and, and furthering this and, and in many ways, maybe disregarding the needs of the rest of the family. This, you know, the, the individual experience of family members is often very different and, um, <clears throat> This is a talk that could have, I mean, I could go on for an hour and a half on this, but what needs to maintain is predictability. The best anecdote for a, a family that is marred with alcoholism or other addictions is some kind of predictable presence. And um, one way to do that is by taking your family to mass every Sunday. I know that at the moment that's not, a, that's not necessarily possible, but that regular consistency, the, the predictability and consistency of some kind of regular household family patterns um, that are healthy, of course, um, can, do, can do very wonderful things, even in the midst of, uh, of great insanity. This here is a, a graph that shows the day and attitude of an addict and their family members. I'm just kidding. That's, this, of course, as we know, is a roller coaster. Um, and this is the life, again, this really does really track the ups and downs of an addict, regardless of what type of, of addiction. Um, and what happens regularly is that family members, rather than just choosing to stay on their feet and stay at the gate, um, is we get on the roller coaster with our loved ones. 
And, and so we experience the same highs and the same lows, the same unpredictability. And because we don't want to abandon the person, you know, this comes from the sense of, well, I don't want to abandon my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, my father, my mother, and my loved one. Um, and so we, you know, and, and we're also not skilled or prepared for how to handle situations like this. Um, shame and fear keep us oftentimes from having conversations with others. And so this can be a very lonely and isolated um, feeling within a family. And many feel like they're doing the best they can by getting on the roller coaster every day with their loved one. Whereas really the best way to maintain stability is by standing at the gate, you know, the person's gonna go by and just being a regular presence and letting them metaphorically know that um, I'm gonna be here if you wanna get off and I'll see you and I do see you and I love you. I promise you that um, not getting on the roller coaster will not add, add to feelings of abandonment. An addict already feels abandoned, regardless of circumstances or situations. And this is not the, the fault of a family member, but they just have a typically, and generally, I'm generalizing, but I think I'm pretty accurate in most cases to say that um, your, your loving addict, or the addict you love, probably already feels abandoned. It's an irrational feeling, um, but it's a feeling that they're living with on a regular basis. And it's not your fault. Now this impacts our church as well, as mentioned. There are, I think, a lot of patterns of, um, of denial, of fear, of secrecy and shame. Um, we see within the church, we have a hard time having conversations about this stuff. And I think that we regularly will um, <clears throat> make excuses for not having those conversations, saying that, well, we can't have a conversation about pornography in mass or, or, or refer to addiction in a, in a homily or other um, communication because that might give people the idea of well then they're going to go see it or there might be kids present i promise you that children are going to have uh, if they're not hearing about these things from the church they're going to be hearing it from their friends and those that will have a less much less measured approach to um, having this conversation with someone and so you know again just one example of how our church is certainly not immune from addictions devastating effects which also doesn't go to um you know, share the causes or the, the challenges faced by parish leaders who, again, are not immune from, um, from addiction. Addiction does not discriminate. Um, so this is something that just like a dysfunctional family operates, um, the church in all of its beauty, in all of its greatness and glory, um, you know, we still in some ways uh, function kind of like a dysfunctional family in some ways. It's beautiful. And um, there's some opportunity for us to find new patterns. So this um, quote from Pope Francis, shortly after he became Pope in 2013, um, I think really summarizes our call as church and what we're, what we're asked to do in the wake of um, uh, an addiction epidemic. So he, he notes, the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds, and you have to start from the ground up. I love that. I think that really captures <clears throat> the, um, both the gravity and really some of the, the simplicity and what, what we're called and asked to do as church and really just, you know, it's <clears throat> getting over some of our own doubts, fears, shame and having these conversations and and really meeting people by by serving them and and healing their wounds i believe that this is also a really great opportunity to evangelize to the greater population those that otherwise may not have um, too many touchstones with the church but people are, are drawn by healing and um and spiritual growth and opportunities to really meet their own really desperate needs um, that was my way into the church i found new life into the church because I, if I'm honest with myself, I wanted to impress an ex-girlfriend who was very Catholic and she at the time was my idol. I couldn't imagine a life without her, just like um, now I couldn't imagine a life without God. Um, but I had to, like that was my pressing need was, it was clear that alcohol and, and drugs were a major deterrent to any kind of happiness and growth in my own life. And I needed to first heal those wounds before I had any chance of diving into some of the more nuanced um, discussions and um, and there's an opportunity for us to do that and I think a really good um, means as we especially 
<laughs> use the buzz buzzwords like accompaniment throughout the process, we can learn a lot from recovery fellowships in the process of accompaniment and, um, and change is made possible that way. So a little bit of a, a background on addiction recovery. Um, Alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous is the first of many 12-step groups that now exist and was uh, started in the 1930s. Um, a group of individuals, men and women, um, specifically Dr. Bob Smith and Bill Wilson, um, who found that really freedom from alcoholism could come when one alcoholic just shares experience, strength, and hope with another. And that by serving others, serving others with a similar condition, that freedom was found. And they then um, wrote the 12 steps, wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, a book which has saved my life, and, um, and then other 12-step you know, meetings, AA first, and others um, began. We, now there are a variety of different 12-step groups, um, many like Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, Narcotics Anonymous, um, Marijuana Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, Sex Addicts Anonymous. There are very ver various versions of these um, groups, as well as those that serve family members, such as Al-Anon and others, um, who provide some more specific um, healing for specific circumstances and situations. I'll, I'll get into the 12 steps. I'll show those to you in a minute. You can certainly reference those on your own. Um, they're pretty universally adaptable. The first step is the, really the only one that discusses specifically either alcohol or one's drug of choice. And the rest are really a roadmap towards um, surrendering to God um, and <clears throat> finding new life and new relationships, reconciling the past um, and living for today. There was a great, there's, there's great Catholic influence in the 12 steps. Um, when shortly after, a few years after the um, AA started, uh, the found, one of its founders, Bill Wilson, was um, approached by a Jesuit priest, Father Ed Dowling. And uh, Father Ed had reached out and actually at that time traveled to Brooklyn where Bill Wilson was living and um, knocked on his door and said, I've, I found great overlap between the spiritual principles of the 12 steps and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. I'd like to have a conversation about this. And um, there's a really great book called The Soul of Sponsorship, which discusses the journey that um, Father Ed Dowling and Bill Wilson, one of the founders of AA, um, their relationship and how they had learned from each other and, and really the influence that the Catholic Church had on the early um, start of, of Alcoholics Anonymous and which has spilled over into other 12-step groups. Now, they do not have a specific understanding of God as we Catholics do. Um, rather, they have a more seeker-sensitive conception of God, which for me when I was new and was not necessarily um, clinging to my identity as a Catholic Christian, um, this was helpful for me to navigate, to really find, um, find God in a way that was approachable and, and understandable. And this is very helpful for many others who come into recovery with either no experience with the church or a negative experience with, with Christianity or various religious affiliations. It's not just Christians that, that find sobriety. Um, but if we look into the really the essence of the 12 steps, we find that it is very sacramental in nature and <clears throat> has great overlap between the, the, um, the church and the sacraments of, or and the, and the 12 steps. So here they are. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to read them and I'm not going to spend too much time here, but um, really allowing us to first recognize the, the nature of our own problems and get over our own uh, denial by just being honest and um, <clears throat> being honest with ourselves, being honest with the sponsor and being honest with God. <clears throat> we we you know, take a few inventories, inventory of the consequences of our actions and behaviors, what we would like a life to look like free from alcohol or free from our drug of choice. And, um, and then in the, in the second and third steps, find true relationship with God which even as Catholic Christians um, may need to be reframed in some ways to find a God that we can do business with, um, a, a loving God that has, um, ha that has purpose in our life and that calls us to more than just our addicted behaviors and patterns. <clears throat> in my book, The 12 Steps in the Sacraments, I do um, overlap the sacramental life of the church with these steps, the 12 steps, and it's ordered in a way that has four parts. Baptism overlaps steps one, two, and three. And in these slides, I have the step and then the, um, the guiding principle associated with each of the steps. 
And so as we first begin the recovery journey, we really need to dip into the waters of baptism to um, just like in Christ's baptism or Jesus' baptism, understand our identity as beloved daughters and sons of God with whom he's well pleased. And, um, and this is an honest, really look, an objective look at our lives um, that frees us you know, from, from our past and frees us from um, the compulsion to have to drink or use drugs or use, reach out for other um, food or, or sexual <clears throat> impurities or other things. And through these waters of baptism, we can find hope and we can find new life. And even, you know, I, uniting ourselves with those who are seeking baptismal preparation. I think that there's something beautiful during the season of Lent where we unite with those who are um, going through and preparing for um, receiving baptism at Easter. Just like in our recovery fellowships, when there's a newcomer in the group who is you know, new in their first couple of days, weeks or months, that group unites and rallies around them, recalling their own, you know, process of first getting sober, what the challenges were, you know, the insane things that we do. And there's a beautiful connection that's that's there. Steps four through nine overlap really beautifully with the sacrament of reconciliation and really the fullness of that sacrament. Step four first asks us to make a personal inventory um, and share that with God, <clears throat> make a personal moral inventory of ourselves. And then step five, sharing that with God, ourselves, and another human being. Step six and seven ask us to humbly ask God to remove whatever defects of character stand in the way of serving him and others. Step eight asks us to make a list of all persons we had harmed and make amends to them all. And then step nine, we go out and we make those amends to do so whenever possible, unless whenever possible we would injure those or others. Um, so you, we, we can take a look at that fullness from the preparation to of the sacrament of reconciliation um, um, and into the process of sharing that with the, with, um, with the priest who stands in persona Christi and then asking God to remove whatever defects of character might um, also, you know, kind of associate themselves with that behavior. And finally, taking the penitential act of really restoring relationships that we've caused harm to, which takes a great deal of humility and courage, um, but ultimately brings, you know, justice to situations which um, we had a hard, which, which we caused injustice to. So a really beautiful um, preparation and transformation that really leads us up to personal healing with ourselves, with God, and um, with our, our family members, our brothers and sisters. And this is really an act, the all 12 steps, something that um, anyone strongly recommend in, engaging in. Um, family members of addicts certainly follow the same 12 steps as they're supported through Al-Anon or other groups. And, um, and it can be very helpful um, when we shed aside, you know, clean house, serve God, love others. Steps 10 and 11 um, overlap with the sacrament of the Eucharist as steps 10, 11, and 12 are, are in some ways referred to simply as maintenance steps. And so through the, you know, the, the transformation that we've gone through steps one through nine, step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. And then step 11 is um, seek through prayer and meditation to maintain our conscious contact with God as we understand him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And so that regular, really, it's, it's coming to our, our receiving our daily bread in many ways. And just like as, as Catholics, we have the opportunity to most intimately receive Jesus Christ through the body, body and blood. Um, in, in a similar way, we need to continue to go to the source of our healing. And that is God through prayer, through our own personal um, reflection and um, understanding how our attitudes, how our, how our behaviors um, and patterns impact the body of Christ. And I think that finding real unity through, um, through the process of the 12 steps with others um, is a great benefit that, um, that I certainly was not expecting. I was really just kind of checking myself into AA, thinking it was the last house on the block. And um, you know, I ended up saving my life, much like the Catholic Church, the last two houses on the block for me. Um, but the door was open, the bread was warm on the table, and, um, and you all were very eager to welcome me, and I'm so grateful for that. Next, um, and finally, the, the step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to practice these principles in, in all of our affairs and to carry the message to others. And, um, and so it's 12 step is exactly, the step 12 is exactly that. It's a life rooted in maintaining these principles in all of our affairs and to share the message of hope with others. And this is really how, how our faith was passed along um, in a very, um, 
just authentic, genuine way. It was just one person sharing the faith with another person. And that's exactly how recovery is passed along. It's shared hope. It's, and there's something that's very powerful in that. Just like I referred previously, you know, many family members of mine, loved ones, friends, close friends would regularly share with me all the reasons why I had to get sober and all the, you know, um, what life could look like. I, that wasn't fitting though within this frame of reference or mind that I had at the time. And so even just imagining what that life was looking to be look like was, was a challenge for me. But instead it was different when I finally showed up to a meeting and someone looked in the eye, looked me in the eye and said, Scott, I know exactly how you feel. You don't ever have to drink again. And I believed him. Um, I, all the evidence aside um, that I was carrying into all of my shame, um, I believe that man, he helped save my life. So step 12 of service and, and sharing the news, the good news with others um, is, is really, you know, I think that when we find uh, people, recovered people, people in recovery in our parishes and our communities, we find people who are of service and who's, who's really the value of their life is dependent on being of service to others, just like they were freely being served. I can attest to that myself. So um, if we look at what is the Catholic Church's response, and we, we noted in many of the, um, the ways that Catholicism has played a part in the development of 12-step groups and how um, parish communities and fellowship can be very, very valuable through that in dispelling some of that isolation and loneliness that comes with um, addiction within a family. And so a few things, and I wanted to first, just as we do this, without just going about saying this might help or, or work, I think it's really vital for us to take a look at what does the process of change look like and um, what are some of those key components to it. And so these three things, relate, repeat, and refrain, um, are come from a, a book, again, Change or Die. And I think that in my experience, both professionally and in, in, working clinically with families, and in my own personal experience in my own recovery and um, spiritual journey, these have been es essential um, and help dispel those very powerful forces of denial, shame, and fear. Remember these. So first, we need to relate with someone. We need to relate and form a new emotional relationship with a person or a community that inspires and sustains hope. And this is, you know, for me, it was showing up to a 12-step group um, full of fear, full of shame, the victim of all circumstances in my life. And, um, but, you know, there was some little bit of faith and courage that had me going there. Again, not expecting much, um, but showing up anyways. And what I found, in fact, this happened to me even before I got in the room that I was in. Um, it was an early morning 7 a.m. meeting. I arrived probably at 6.59. And above the stairs, the group was held upstairs. I could hear laughter and camaraderie. I was thinking, I've got to be in the wrong place. If these people know anything about what I'm going through, they have no reason to be laughing. And, you know, I just remember I sat down, you know, and everyone was announcing themselves as an alcoholic, but doing so with the sense of victory. I was a victim of my circumstances, my life as an alcoholic. And um, so there was diff very different, it was very different from what I expected. In addition, I was also expecting and used to this, um, whenever I would share, you know, the, what was going wrong in my life or what the things, the challenges were, I was regularly, or at least I expected to receive condemnation. And so when I went through the process of sharing with another person or a group, you know, what I had been through and rather than being condemned, found support and love, was patted on the back and, you know, they was told, keep coming back. Um, that was a new experience for me and that allowed me to both to to relate with individuals and the group as a whole and then the next step is repeat that this new relationship helps you learn practice and master the new habits and skills that you'll need the beautiful thing about recovery is that everyone's recovery is contingent upon their service um, to other people and so many people just like the person who helped save my life and others who have dedicated so much time to me have dedicated have really spent one-on-one -on -one individual time in in fellowship and just meeting me where i was at um not not leaving me there um but really building me up to this place where i could develop a faith a life of faith some tools and skills because i was just running on really old immature um coping behaviors and matter and and um approaches to living and so i needed to develop and see new habits um, and I needed to see it in other people. That inspired hope in me. And hope, I cannot stress enough, is a very, very important thing in this process. We need people who are hopeful 
to build hope among other people. And people who are hopeful um, are those that have been through challenge, who have been through hell and have no, no intention of ever going back there. And then that reframing, we, the, the new relationship helps us learn new ways of thinking about your situation in, my, in life. And, um, and so this allows us to then, our, our frame is view, we can envision a future which previously would have seemed impossible. Um, if I'm, you know, we can uh, factor in a life that was otherwise, you know, I couldn't imagine going a day without drinking, just like I couldn't imagine um, living a happy life without my ex-girlfriend who had become my idol. I needed a community and I needed individuals in my life who could help dispel that and shift that focus from her and from my own selfish needs to uh, a relationship with God. And that happened not just immediately, but it, it, it took seeing other people's relationship with God and their desperate approach to recovery and to a spiritual way of life and to a life rooted in the sacraments um, that was helpful for me. And so combining those things is a key element of change. And I think our call as, as Catholics. This picture um, I add as a, this is taking about a month into my own recovery and sobriety. This was in November of 2011. My recovery journey started in October of 2011. And this man, Brock, was a man that I met at, at my church, not uh, an uh, alcoholic or an addict himself, but was leading a Bible study. And um, when it was suggested to me that I get involved in the church in some way um, and meet like-minded peers, that he was the first person that, um, that I found. And this on this day, um, about a, a month into our friendship and relationship, I decided as we were at tickets to this the Rose Bowl football game and I called him up and asked him if he wanted to join. And on the way up, on the drive up, I shared with him that I was in recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction, um, that, you know, the, the, my life previous to this kind of newfound faith was very um, desperate, was very dark and lonely and that I was grateful for his friendship, but also understood if he didn't want to come on the trip with me that day and wanted to end things because I was so ashamed of what I was sharing um, and I was expecting condemnation. But Brock provided an opportunity to first relate, rethink, and then reframe my uh, understanding of the church, of myself, of, of who I was in relationship with God. And you know, he said he, on that day, he shared, you know, thank you. He shared some of his own um, uh, insecurities or, or challenges that he has and uh, it united us in a way that um, that only God can. So I wanted to share that anecdote of how important this process of change is and how much respect we ought to give. Now I just want to briefly share a little, few of the resources that we have available at Catholic in Recovery and you can find all these at catholicinrecovery.com. Um, first and th really three keys to our, um, our approach to um, sharing hope. And first is fellowship. We provide a variety of uh, in-person groups in parishes around the country. We now have over 30 Catholic and recovery groups in 10 different states. And these are held in parishes or sometimes in Catholic community centers like Catholic charities or diocesan offices or retreat centers. We are now also offering virtual meetings in person or uh, vir virtual meetings online um, and have meetings available now Monday through Saturday. You'll find our online um, database of meetings available on our website as well and, um, and and really see this as an opportunity to serve church because you know if, if people are not gathering in fellowship in person uh, that can be a very challenging thing both in, as individuals and family members but also as our, our society if, if addicts are not being treated with the necessary medicine of fellowship um, then we might be in trouble but many groups both you know secular recovery groups and and our catholic and recovery groups are moving to provide resources resources online so if you yourself would like to check one out that's a really great opportunity to get a taste of what a catholic and recovery meeting is like and, and see firsthand the hope and really beautiful honesty openness and willingness of of those that join um, in addition faith we, we welcome others in, in catholic and recovery groups by um, sharing sharing experiences of healing and uh, finding that it's been a great evangelical tool for those who are either coming back to the church for the first time in a long time, or for those who are brand new to the church and feel called to find a deeper relationship, a more specific relationship with their higher power. And then finally, Freedom, we have a variety of articles and other resources, community forums and um, outreach on our website that can be helpful to get into some of the more nuanced and specific topics of, of recovery um, and, and lasting change. So I hope that you'll take an opportunity just to seek those.
now with um, about maybe 10 minutes or so left, um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Aaron to see if we have any questions. And um, again, if you have any questions that aren't answered here, or if you have a more specific question, you can feel free to reach out. Um, my email address is scott at catholicandrecovery.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. And yes, I encourage you all um, to type in a question in the um, question panel. And I actually already have a question here from Lynn. Um, she states, you stated that addiction is not a moral issue. There are steps into addiction. Often it begins with sin, perhaps like uh, beginning drinking as a youth. Um, the young person may be disobeying parents, civil law, and so on. That is a moral component. As repeated and into habit, um, culpability is lessened, but the initial beginning point and growth into the addiction is a moral starting point. Please address this from your perspective. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think that's... Uh, uh, good to take a look at and, and certainly there are moral um, elements that we take a look at. Step four asks us to take a thorough moral and fearless, a fearless and thorough moral inventory of ourselves and so we are certainly not um, not shedding responsibility for moral um, actions taken. What that statement largely is representative of is that the presence of an addiction in, in one's life is not um, just the presence alone is not a moral is not a moral issue. This person is not morally bankrupt because they um, have an addiction present in their lives. Just like a family is not a morally bankrupt family because a, a member is is addicted. And so, you know, we we certainly there are steps that go into that. And for me, you know, I can relate certainly. I, you know, standards really. <laughs> It, what happens when we get to that line of addiction is that rather than raising our behavior to meet our own standards, we typically lower our standards to, to meet where our behavior is, that, is at. And so that process just keeps continually happening. And so it's not just going from, you know, saint to sinner um, on, in one moment, but rather it's the process of, I think, lowering our, our, our bar, our moral bar in some ways. Um, to do that. And so, you know, for me, that looked like, um, you know, I held some very, uh, very strong um, expectations of myself when it came to sexual purity and things like that in, in high school. And slowly that bar was lowered and lowered and lowered, as well as, you know, I was only telling myself I'm not going to drink at a, until a certain age or and then that became lower. And then I'm, I began using drugs and marijuana and then I was just going to be at marijuana. But then the drugs became harder and harder and my bar was lowered, 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 lowered. And so at each state, <clears throat> I wouldn't, and, and I think that this, a lot of it really is um, how we categorize or define sin. I would take, a, I would um, in a very, very broad sense, share that sin is distance from God. And so, yes, there is certainly a lot of a distance between us and God when um, an addiction is present. And um, that doesn't necessarily, that distance is, is in some capacity or on some scale, probably true in, in many of our lives. Thank you. Um, Connie asks, do people who join Catholic in Recovery also attend other 12-step meetings? Good question. Thank you. Um, yes, typically, those who do well and, and, um, and, and find long-lasting freedom. Now, you know, we've had many people who have, you know, um, just got off the phone earlier today with a woman who leads a Catholic in Recovery group in Little Falls, um, Minnesota. And she shared that they have a group member who's been around for the last four months, and he had tried three or four um, treatment centers. Had spent a lot of money, him and his family, in order to combat this, and um, and has you know upon showing up uh, and attending a Catholic recovery meeting, has been sober ever since. And there's this um, this almost a spiritual safeguarding and and intimacy in some ways that's created there now, and so so people can find lasting change in Catholic in recovery. However, and um, we we don't um, claim to be a substitute for other 12-step recovery groups. In many ways, hopefully acting as a bridge to more specific um, treatment, fellowship treatment um, in in 12 in other 12-step recovery groups. And our general recovery groups are comprised of people with a variety of different types of addictions. So, you know, sitting around a table, we'll have alcoholics, recovering drug addicts, compulsive overeaters, people that struggle with lust addiction, gambling addiction, family members impacted by addiction, and all of whom really the process 
looks very much the same. Various symptoms of the same spiritual malady. And, um, and so the process, uh, just like I mentioned before, the process of addiction and some of the, you know, the shame, fear, secrecy, and denial, all very similar. And the 12 steps and the solution is often very similar as well. It's really intimate relationship with Jesus Christ as, as um, supported by a relationship with others and, and, and shedding those things that stand in our way of, of relationship with God and building up those things that do. And so, yes, we do strongly recommend that people find a group that is specific to their own personal needs, in addition to attending Catholic and recovery groups. And in some ways, um, in many ways, we have people who are coming back to the church, finding a local Catholic and recovery group, and then enrolling in RCIA or um, getting into the church elsewhere. But I also understand that just like people have preconceived ideas of what the church is like who aren't in the church, people have preconceived ideas of what 12-step recovery groups are like. And so what that process is like is that, um, you know, it's nice for them to come to the church where they're looking for healing resources and they can hear the experience of other people who have, um, you know, there's, and in 12 step groups, we're, people are sharing about the church, but not always in the most positive way. And I, I, I still understand that, that is a challenging thing. Um, that doesn't mean that Catholics should be pulled from those groups. And for me, um, I don't go to AA because of the sound theology. I go there because it saves my life. And I can find sound theology elsewhere. I need to do a little bit of additional work uh, for that. And it's also a place where I can share the beauty, hope, and truth and goodness of the church and, and be uh, a light. Um, so, yes, it, uh, that's a long way to <laughs> answer your question. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, Carrie asked if you could repeat the books you mentioned um, during your presentation. I think you mentioned two. Yes. Um, well, I mentioned the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, if you're going to get one book, I would get that one. That's a great book. The first 164 pages have not changed since they were printed in 1939. And um, yes, so that book, fantastic. Um, another book is this one right here. It's called Change or Die by Alan Deutschman. Uh, kind of a strong title. And uh, he relates people with a variety of different um, conditions and such to show and the, how, how challenging change can really be and how that process of change works. It's a secular book. It's not a Christian book per se. Um, and I forget what the other book was that the, I mentioned. The other one was um, The Soul of Sponsorship. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, the Soul of Sponsorship, which um, shares the journey and friendship of Bill Wilson, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Father Ed Dowling, a Jesuit priest. Are they the authors? No. Um, okay. We could just Google I it. Off the top of my yeah, head with the that's no problem. Um, Jennifer asks, do you also host online meetings for families of addicts? Yes, we do. Great question. So we the three different types of meetings that we have available online <clears throat> include our general recovery meetings, and we have those meetings available Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. We have group meetings for family members impacted by loved ones addiction. Those groups are held on Wednesday and Friday. And we also have groups specific to men seeking recovery from pornography and sex addiction, lust addiction. Now that is not an issue that is just specific to men. And I would love, love, love to have a, um, a women's group that supports the same thing. I just haven't found the person to facilitate that group and it's not my place to be. So if you or someone you know would be um, a, a leader or willing to support that, I think that that's an important conversation to have to dispel some some other stigmas you know, within the church and some sub stigmas of an already um, stigmatic topic, if that makes sense. Yes. So yes, um, you can find the list of those meetings and uh, login details and dates and times on our website, catholicandrecovery.com. Paul asks, as a parent of an adult addict, uh, alcoholic, how can we help him when he doesn't want help? He lives with us and brings us so much stress and havoc to our home. Um, unfortunately, he's a mean drunk. Yeah, that's hard. Um, be kind to yourself, first and foremost. Um, you know, we... He's living in a frame of reference that is hard to see this. It's, not, it's a different frame of reference than you're living in. And I think that it's important to have really have strong boundaries. This is probably not new information, but to really, I think, setting up those boundaries in a way of um, what are the things that um, 
Am I helping him do things that he can do for himself? Or is it something that he, he can't do for himself? And if he can do it for himself, then perhaps by you doing it for him is, um, is taking away the opportunity that he has to do it himself. Now, he may not want to. And um, if he doesn't want to, then, you know, then what help is it anyways? And um, I would also note that it's, um, what are the, what, ask yourself, what are the reasons that he has to get sober? What are the reasons why he has to get sober? Not why you have to get sober for him, not why the reasons why you think he should get sober. What are his reasons? And, um, and if he hasn't reached those reasons yet, what am I doing anything to keep him from that? So for example, if, you know, I'll, first question I'll often ask a family member who comes to me with this question, and it's a common question. And I think, and I have so much respect for the pain that come, that the question comes from. Um, but my first question is, what are the consequences that he's that he's that he or she has experienced as a result of their be of addiction or alcoholism or whatever it might be? And um, if if you have a hard time answering that question, or if your answer looks like sounds something like, well, you know, his car he was going to lose his car, but so we pay, made a couple of payments on the car and and this, and he lost his home, and he couldn't afford anything, so we brought him in. I know these are really really challenging, nuanced. Um, situations to deal with, but um, if he hasn't found that reason yet, then um, you, are you doing any justice by um, by keeping that from he, keeping him from finding those reasons? So you know, it's, it's certainly challenging. I, I I think that really the best thing that we can do is put ourselves in in fellowship with other people who are going through the same thing to realize that you're not alone, to um, to bounce other coping strategies off, and just you're right. It's hard. It can be as, as, as it can be very stressful living with someone who um, has an active addiction. And so, if there's not a place where you're finding to take care of yourself, um, then it's going to be a challenge. But keep keep at it. Keep loving unconditionally. Um, although unconditional love doesn't necessarily mean unconditional um, servant mentality. I don't, I don't, that's an okay way to share that. Mm -hmm. And Catholic in Recovery has groups for individuals like this. Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay, awesome. All right, well, um, I, I want to thank Scott so much for sharing your story um, and your, your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, and for all those who sent in questions, thank you today, and definitely our hearts go out to those who are suffering. Um, as a result of the Indiana Stay at Home Ordinance, Ave Maria Press is also closed its doors until um, April 7th. And so we always like to offer you guys a discount on the book featured, Scott's 12 Step, The 12 Steps and the Sacraments. Um, you can certainly go to our website and purchase this today, um, but we won't be able to ship it to you actually until April 13th. Um, the book is available on Amazon. We also have a great ebook sale right now um, in which you can get the book for $2.99. Uh, but I did extend the code a little bit due to these circumstances. I um, also want to remind you that the webinar has been recorded and I will share that in a link with you in the email that you receive tomorrow. Um, and join us not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Um, Chris Wesley will talk about how to recruit and manage um, dynamic teams of volunteers to really um, kind of bring your ministry up a level. Um, we always thank you so much for being with us. And as I said before, um, our prayers are for all of your safety and your health. Um, have a great day and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Scott. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.